What is the mandate of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce? I think we all intuitively know, but what is it really? Well, ultimately, it's to be the indispensable partner of business and to be their voice um, to help create the conditions within which business prospers, whether that be regulatory, tax, um, or even a host of services that we provide our members, many of whom are small and medium-sized businesses from every corner of the province. Now, everybody has a wish list, including individuals. I want to pay less for things. I want to be paid more. If I sell things, I want to sell them at a higher rate. I want less regulation. I want my employees to make less and perform better. I think those are realistic things that almost everybody wants. But what are the goals that are um, concrete, achievable, that will make Ontario more prosperous as far as you see? Well, look, regulatory clarity uh, is an important step, particularly when you have uh, a situation as we do today where government is not exactly rolling in dough. Um, the province of Ontario has close to 400,000 regulations on the books. Uh, compare that to British Columbia, which has a little under 200,000. Uh, last time I checked, British Columbia is not referred to as Dickensian England. Uh, it manages to protect its water, its people, safety with 200,000 regulations, and yet we have 400,000. That adds to time, that adds to money, um, that adds to frustration, uh, none of which, particularly small and medium-sized businesses that don't have legal departments, don't have HR, where the owner entrepreneur is HR, is the general counsel, uh, and has to deal with all of these things. That's a, that's a big uh, step. The whole skills issue is something that comes up with uh, the vast majority of our members. For the last three years, we've been surveying them in terms of what do they see as the number one obstacle to their own economic prosperity and that of the province. And, over 75% of our members list the skills gap uh, as that number one issue. And that's not just a government issue, it's not just a schools issue, uh, it's a societal issue as well. We have all kinds of problems with respect to skilling and reskilling our people in an economy that is rapidly evolving. Now, your members are not talking about CAD CAM robotics and using a brace and bit and being able to use a slide rule. They're talking about computer skills, I assume. Well, they're talking about a wide variety of things. Yes, you've got a Shopify in the Ottawa Valley that's concerned about where their next computer programmer or software engineer is going to come from. But you also have the construction firm or Bruce Power or OPG or Metrolink saying, where are we going to get the skilled trades to do this $144 billion of infrastructure spending over the next 10 years when the average age of a journeyman and you pick the skilled trade, boilermaker, electrician, carpenter, plumber, um, is nearing 60. Uh, we've got a clear and present uh, danger in the economy on that front. And, and just to be clear, these are uh, red seal uh, sanctioned, certified trades whose work we know is safe and good and up to par. 100%. Well, isn't one of the problems that we, I believe we have 200 apprenticeable trades in, in Ontario. Uh, women, uh, Indigenous people and new Canadians uh, pass Way those courses. Way underrepresented. No, but they pass those courses a little at a little higher rate than than average. So it's good for women, it's good for Indigenous people, it's good for new Canadians but they are not attending. Nobody is attending in, in the rate we need and we do have a, a shortage of skilled trades. Aren't we kind of conning young people into going to university as the, as the, the, the ticket to a prosperous life? Uh, absolutely, look, I'm a perfect example. I'm the, I'm the son of immigrants and my parents from a very young age told me they never wanted to see me on a construction site. They never wanted to see me swinging a hammer, pushing a wheelbarrow. I was gonna go to university I was going to wear a suit, work in an office, and come home each night with clean hands. And the net result of that is that my plumber can buy and sell me four times over. He's got a place in Scottsdale, another one in Georgian Bay, and runs a million dollar business where he decides which clients he wants to serve. Uh, and we have enormous needs on that front. The stigma that we've developed over the last couple of generations that if you're smart, you need to go to university. If you're not quite so smart, go to a college. And if you're a dummy, take a trade. 
uh, is totally misleading uh, our young people in terms of where the opportunities are to build really good middle class and above lives for themselves and their families. And yet you're also a former politician and perhaps a future politician. Would you have had the guts if you were the Minister of Labor in Ontario or the Mayor of Toronto to say that to people? Absolutely, and I still I say that each and every day and at every occasion that I can because it helps that it's the truth and um, it's also that there's a, been a tremendous evolution. The notion that today's auto mechanic is the same as the grease monkey of 50 years ago is totally wrong because it does involve computers, it does involve greater technical um, skills and if you add an entrepreneurial flair to it, you can create wonderful businesses with these skills as well. So this is what you meant uh, when you said about five minutes ago, that it's not just a schooling issue, but it's a societal issue, it's attitudinal. Is that what you meant? Yes, it's a, it's a stigma. But within the school front, consider this. Virtually 100% of all guidance counselors in the province of Ontario are university graduates. Their knowledge of college, let alone the trades, is theoretical at best and not where they default. Yes, what do they? Well, it involves wrenches. <laughs> they, can, they can tell I those things. So, yeah. Now, you seem to be on top of uh, uh, all your files. Uh, let me just try this on for size. The emergency preparedness function, in, uh, well, you've already made a face, yeah. um, in cities is mandated by the province. There is legislation that requires an emergency plan and it's testing every year. This is ignored and in abridgment by, in many communities. One emergency plan, uh, I think it's Oakville, says there's no consistent approach within Ontario. And if you read the plans, which I have, they have different terminology, different approaches, different rankings, color codings. I mean, there is everything except a partridge in a pear tree to, to cause them to be at variance with each other. Now, where this becomes a Chamber of Commerce issue is that you can't uh, drive your trucks full of goods or your car full of intellectual property across a road that's underwater. You can't store your goods in a warehouse with the roof ripped off, and you can't sell your goods and services to dead people. What is the Chamber of Commerce doing about this? And because of the face you made, I assume you know about this. Well, the whole issue of the building of resilient communities. I mean, forget about the, the debate over uh, what causes climate change. The reality is it's happening and it's having enormous impacts in terms of flooding, in terms of weather events. Um, and we simply have to be prepared. Things that used to be referred to as 100-year storms are happening more and more frequently. Uh, and to your point, if we uh, are going to have the infrastructure that we need to underpin growing commerce, then we have to be looking at it with a lens of building resiliency and sustainability in our communities. And to your point, there is tremendous variation in the way that there is unfortunately with way too much because we have vastly different capacities. The capacity, the amount of people on a problem that uh, a jurisdiction like the City of Toronto has versus uh, Gananoque or Timmins or, or, or Chatham is, is utterly different. And that's not to say that there are bad people in these areas. They are, but they're overwhelmed and they don't necessarily have the capacity to deal with all of those issues in the same way. So there does have to be more coordination and more capacity to build capacity in these, in these jurisdictions. Well, and in fairness, uh, politicians like you used to be have to make dispassionate decisions. And if you're in Timmins or Chatham uh, and there's an emergency, citizens can often go to their neighbor's home or a relative's home or drive out of town. If you're in Toronto, you get onto the Gardner or the Don Valley Parkway and you sit there. It's not going to be a traffic jam, it is going to be a parking lot. Right. What, what, are your, what do your members think about this challenge? Well, uh, again, it varies. I mean, we have uh, members from the smallest uh, entrepreneurs, single, uh, single person shop up to uh, the banks or the insurance companies and clearly the entire insurance industry, property and casualty is seized with this issue because they're seeing uh, enormous new claims at a level that they've not seen uh, before caused by this and so 
there is a great deal of advocacy work and research being done. And in fact, uh, we at the Ontario Chamber of Commerce are going to be leading an effort uh, in, the, in the new year around the building of resilient communities. Um, and speaking of which, uh, you must have some goals in your mind about what you want to say, this is what I got done during my tenure, and whether you're there for you know, one, three, five, seven years is not the issue. What are those goals? Share some of those with us. Well, I come back to the issue of skills. Um, I, I believe firmly that the jurisdiction in the world that figures out not just how to skill our young people, but continually reskill over the career that will be more varied for our, uh, our population than ever before. The notion that you're gonna spend 35 years in one organization and retire with a gold watch is virtually history. Um, so to the extent that I and the Ontario Chamber of Commerce can have a role in advocating and pushing to solutions on that front, I think would be a tremendous legacy to leave. Now, tremendous goal, and that uh, history you speak of is uh, ancient history. Uh, Alvin Toffler's book, Future Shock, 1973, said exactly that. We are into serial careers. If you think you're joining an organization for your uh, working life, forget it. Funny that we're still addressing that and haven't got our minds around that totally yet, eh? Well, uh, stigmas are hard and patterns of life are hard and institutions like even how we educate. You know, we, we develop systems of education uh, that were built in a time of an agrarian society. So you wanted, uh, you know, uh, children free to help on the farms in the, in the summer and uh, the timing, the hours of work, uh, the weekends off. Uh, the notion of a four-year university career or college career and then forget it uh, yeah and then <laughs> and then you're fine for the rest of life uh, well that that in itself it's history you're now hearing discussions around uh, concepts like micro credentialing so uh, you you go you spend six weeks uh, you do a boot camp in programming uh, or along the way uh, short of becoming a red seal uh, carpenter if you could specialize and be given the skills to be able to hang doors, well, right now there's the need for you know a thousand door hangers in residential and commercial construction in the Greater Toronto area. We have a quarter of all of the cranes in North America in our region. Uh, you need the next three fastest growing cities in North America to total what we have in Toronto today. So um, there's a remarkable amount of, of, of work going on and need for people with these skills. Um, I wouldn't be doing a good job if I didn't uh, do two things before you leave and get back to the conference. Yeah. One, anything else you wanted to discuss which I didn't raise? Well, I think another big issue that we need to do a much better job at um, is the issue of trade. You know, Canada proudly states and our federal politicians of all political stripes, you know, we've signed more free trade agreements than any other country in the OECD, and that's true. Um, but until and unless you focus on enhancing your own productivity, you're not actually going to be able to optimize the impact uh, of those trading arrangements. We just celebrated an anniversary of the signing of, of uh, CETA with the, uh, the European Union um, and container traffic volumes in the Port of Montreal are up double digits year over year. But far more of that is European companies selling to Canada versus the other way around. We uh, have for too long uh, been very comfortable in our relationship with the U.S. And to the extent that we think about trade, we think about trade north-south. We need to understand, and one thing President Trump has taught us in no uncertain terms, is that you can't take anything for granted. And so Canada needs more friends, more trading relations. Uh, we need to do a better job on that. And the first step towards that is to reduce all of the barriers we have between provinces because we're already a small economy as it is. We don't need to make ourselves 
smaller through our own steps and make us less competitive in the rest of the world. Well, interprovincial trade barriers would be a whole other interview. You'd never get back to the conference. <laughs> Secondly, uh, speaking of ancient history, 1971, I think it was, a free uh, foreign policy See. for Canadians, the so-called third way. We were going to trade with Europe and Japan and Asia and be an Asia-Pacific country. Didn't quite pan out. We're, you're, you're still arguing for that. Well. We're arguing for it, and I think that, again, this whole negotiation over the, the renewal of NAFTA, the creation of USMCA, the difficulty in ratification there, the, um, uh, the tariffs that were put on steel and aluminum, um, I think has shaken the Canadian psyche in a way that uh, that discussion in the mm. 70s did not reach that level of intensity. Correct. Now, the second thing um, I must do before I let you go, uh, and I would do this with every former politician, if there is an announcement you'd like to make about your political future, we're all ears. Well, first of all, uh, I, I never successfully won uh, an election. I ran twice and was defeated twice. So um, even to call, my, call me a former politician, um, uh, exaggerates my role uh, in life. Let us say that there are multiple ways to serve and I'm delighted serving in the manner that I am today. And most people don't stand for election, let alone get election, so thank you for your attempted service. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir.